All right, everyone, welcome to this episode of the Vayner Bloomin Leadership Podcast. I'm Carrie. I'm part of the client relations team here at Vayner Bloomin, and we are excited to have Kevin East joining us today. Kevin is the president and CEO of the Mentoring Alliance. Uh, he also has a podcast called Following to Lead. Uh, at the Mentoring Alliance, they exist to mobilize godly people into the lives of kids and families and to provide tangible help and eternal hope. And so we are excited to welcome Kevin here. Uh, he loves working a chainsaw, so I don't know if we'll get into that <laughs> today. But Kevin, welcome to the Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Carrie. Glad to be with you. And yes, I do love my chainsaw. Would love to talk about that, but that's probably another podcast for another day. So. <laughs> that may be, that may be. Well, Kevin, uh, first, give us just a quick overview of maybe a little of your ministry journey uh, the Mentoring Alliance, who you guys are, what you do. Yeah, so, you know, I've been involved in, in Christ Center Ministry for 30 years uh, at a church level, at a large nonprofit level, summer camps. Um, and then now I've been leading this ministry for the last 10 years called Mentoring Alliance. Um, and basically what we do is our website says we mentor kids. It's what we do. And we yeah, I consider it to be discipleship, right? We mentor kids through after school programs, summer camps and one-on-one -on -one volunteer relationships with at-risk kids and communities. And so um, I came out about 10 years ago, like I said, just celebrated 10 years and we've come a long way with it, but uh, we've been getting um, hopefully better and better at what we're doing so we can begin to continue to expand into other regions and continue to impact those kids and families there as well. Yeah, and so currently you guys are in Texas, correct? We serve East Texas and out in what we call Greater Tyler. We serve Central Texas and the Greater Waco area, and we're expanding to Abilene to serve the Greater Abilene area this next summer. So um, it's exciting time of growth for us, for sure. Yeah, that's great. That's great, especially coming out of COVID and everything. With that, I'm I'm sure the challenges of trying to mentor kids during COVID, all of that uh, were great. But what kind of kingdom impact are you guys seeing right now as you kind of engage adults in local communities to actually be mentoring young people? Uh, what do you guys see in the Lord do and breathe on? Yeah, so so honestly, Carrie, th my story goes back, you know, we've been foster parents for almost 15 years now. And in the foster system, we end up adopting two kids out of the foster system. We still foster to this day. We have an eight-year-old little girl with us right now uh, with our family. And I just, you know, the burden that God put on my heart, I, I started recognizing that I had this, I would get angry at movies where I saw a fatherless child in the movie. And I was like, man, I, you know, I went one time, sat on the front porch in a rocking chair. I, I walked out of a movie that we were watching in our den. And I sat on the front porch in a rocking chair. My wife came out there. She said, what's wrong? I was like, that is not entertainment. Like, I don't enjoy that at all. Yeah. And I started seeing this burden that God was really kind of growing in me about what can we do about kids and families and communities that are growing up. Um, I think the the key, the, the catchphrase these days is under-resourced, but with all sorts of challenges. Um, how can we get God's people involved in that? And, and God's people are already involved in so many ways, but how can we get God's people involved in it in a different way? And so we start asking ourselves, what would it look like to provide, in the words we ended up putting to it, we're we want to provide tangible help and eternal hope both. How can we do that in communities? And over a period of time, what we came up with was after school is an important time of the day that a lot of families, maybe like yours or mine, Carrie, you know, kids are used to coming home and there's cheese it's waiting for them and there's you know whether it be a fun tv show to watch or a bike to ride or parental supervision things that we just kind of take for granted sure in a lot of communities that, that's not possible when you have a single mom working or you have a guardian watching multiple families kids or things like that and so uh we started providing we started mobilizing as we say godly people into that environment into the after school environment in the form of part-time staff to really mentor kids in after school programs. We do Bible studies in public schools in the after school wow. because public schools can be used for religious purposes after hours. And so we serve five or six different school districts now mm -hmm. in that environment. And then when you start looking at like our one on one volunteer mentoring, the whole goal is to mobilize the church. You know, it's, it's the role of the pastor to prepare God's people for works of service sure. in the church setting. 
And yep. we go, man, that's awesome. There are so many people that want to impact kids, especially that come from tough backgrounds. And they go, I don't know what to do. Maybe I could buy a turkey at Thanksgiving for them. Maybe I could do angel tree kids at Christmas time. What can I do? In the communities we serve, we say, you know what? You could mentor a child. You can walk life with their family. We call it share life with every child we serve, capital L, I life. You're not yeah. their savior. We're there to share Jesus and walk life with them. That's great. And so that's the cool things we're seeing is God's people really stepping up and stepping into that environment, which we really love seeing. Yeah. I love that you give people the opportunity. I love, uh, as you were just talking about it, so so many of our listeners will, are familiar with church planting and, you know, renting out a school for Sunday services, all of that. But uh, you're absolutely right that after hours during the week, uh, just as important for those kids and to have that place to be able to go to, to have those people who will be investing Christ and, and what does it mean to walk in in life with Christ? I, I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. You've been with the Mentoring Alliance since 2013. How in that time frame we had COVID. So you, you've seen a few different things happen. Uh, how have you seen what you guys do change? How have you seen uh, even some of culture and some of that family structure and dynamic shift and change in those 10 years? Yeah. So, you know, as an organization, we've come a long way uh, in 10 years, um, but maybe at a greater level, what I, I've seen, what everybody else has seen, the sense of a global pandemic coming through and just upending everything that you do. For us, it's impacted us most because we hire hundreds of part-time and summer staff, mm. godly people. And all of a sudden, it's like to hire people has just become much more difficult. To yeah. find the right people, to hire them, train them well, mobilize them. Um has become much more difficult. So in the pandemic season, you know, we're serving school districts, schools are shutting down, we're having to adapt what we do to go, how can we best come alongside school districts to mentor kids in this space and time right now? And we partner with school districts, we were delivering homework in some school districts um, because they recognize these kids were what they call school dependent learners. And so when they're at home, they weren't learning. Right. So we're delivering food to homes, we're delivering homework to homes. We had mentors, volunteer mentors stay engaged um, and things like that. But over these 10 years as an organization, we've become much more clear about who we are as a ministry mm -hmm. that, you know, in some organizations, um, as many that I talked to, they were like, yeah, we're a ministry. And what they mean by it is we pray and say the Pledge of Allegiance before board meetings. Mm -hmm. But being a ministry didn't go much further than that. And that we were one of those organizations that we said, okay, what does it really mean? In seminary, there's a phrase they would teach, they taught me and taught people, you know, you need to come to terms with authors. What do they say when they, when they say this in a book, what do they really mean by that term? You need to come to terms with them. Why well, to come to terms with my board? When we talk about being a ministry, let's talk about what we mean. Like what I say ministry, what I really mean is we're hiring godly people who the gospels transform their hearts. Yep. They are now ambassadors of reconciliation, according to second Corinthians five, like, and they're living and serving, living out the kingdom in the communities that we serve. Like, that's what I mean by ministry. What do y'all mean by ministry? Yeah. And they're like, we want that. That's what we want. So we changed everything um, to become a ministry in that sense of the word over these 10 years. And then now as we go to other districts, we talk to superintendents, school leaders, school boards. And surprisingly, um, we're able to work with public schools where they say, we love what y'all do. You're meeting a huge need, which we call providing tangible help, after school programs, summer camps, partner with school districts where they're teaching one hour of math and one hour of reading right in the middle of our summer camps that are happening in schools. Yeah. Again, how? Because public schools can be used for religious purposes after hours. That's already been decided by the National Supreme Court in the early 2000s. So that's a neat thing for us to see like, wow, Lord, look at what you've opened up. Look at the opportunity you've opened up for us to do. And we're going to shoot that gap. We're going to run into it and pray, Lord, you would use us in a powerful way as we do. 
Well, and how amazing you're using the ability to meet a tangible need to make a pathway for the gospel. And yeah. you know, as we look at the book of Acts, that's exactly what the early church does. The Paul journeys into a town and miracles and healings and all of this happen. And suddenly everyone's very attentive at that point to the gospel. But you go in and you just start preaching in it and there's a stoning that's going to happen. Right. So yeah. I, love, I love how you guys have taken that very practical approach of how do we be helpful, right? How, how do we not be a burden to the school system, but how do we actually help meet a need that they have that yeah. helps what they're doing be better, even if they're not explicitly Christian, uh, mm -hmm. they can see the impacts that the gospel has before having to actually even give themselves over to the gospel. That's great. That's yeah. great. That's it's a, a neat partnership. It's, it's something that we're, is we tell them we want to provide tangible help and eternal hope both um people in this day and age as you can imagine they get get scared off by whoa, whoa you're going to talk about jesus and it's like well our bible studies are optional for families mm -hmm. they have to opt their kids into them but of the five or six different school districts we serve right now about 98 percent of the families opt their kids into our bible studies they're like i'd love for my child to learn about god sure, sure. and then you hear all sorts of families going you know we've 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 told stories of kids coming to Christ in after school programs, going home and sharing Christ with their parents, their parents getting saved, going to church and them all getting baptized. It's really an amazing opportunity. Yeah. But it's the same thing. There are great people listening that lead all sorts of neat ministries and nonprofits. They're pastoring churches. And it's that same question we ought to be asking, like, Lord, how do you want to use us? Like, how can we be a part of bringing your kingdom here to earth right now? And for us, this is how it's played out, you know, mentoring kids walking life with their families through these three different programs that we do. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. So part of that journey has to begin with vision. Uh, and I know that's a big passion of yours. And so you have a platform here to speak to other CEOs, uh, other pastors who have that same ministry drive. They feel that passion. I was talking to someone just yesterday uh, and he's going and meeting with his board and trying to get some progress on some things. Uh, maybe let's spend a couple of minutes and if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit about vision uh, and some things that you've learned about vision through the years and just share it with us so that uh, we can be learning and growing. Yeah. And really hearing, hey, how do we make this applicable. I, I run into people all the time who will say, I don't know what to do with vision. And we got a statement, but I don't know what, what to do with it. So any any wisdom you would give us from your journey? Yeah. So like, look, people listening, there are, I'm sure, executive pastors, there's senior pastors, there's executive directors of nonprofits, there's department leaders, there's people who aspire to lead. There's all different types of people listening, right? And what we know is the why behind this is that Proverbs 29 tells us where there is no vision, the people perish or the people run around wildly. We know that the Bible says that. And then we get in these roles of leadership and it's like, okay, well, maybe somebody else will provide it. I was sitting one time with a business owner, sharp, sharp guy, owns an oil company. And he said, you know, Kevin, I'm just not like you. He said, I, I don't speak like you from stage. I, I just, I, I feel so ill-equipped to be basically the leader of this company. And we had a, a really sweet conversation about what it means to be a leader of that company or to be the leader of this ministry like I am. And I just started thinking, you know what, I, I want to bring vision and what it is down to a lower shelf for him in the sense of don't be intimidated by this. So in other words, I started writing down notes over the years, trying to make it catchy to go, how can I get people to remember this? But in one sense, I was, I was telling him that day, when we think of vision, most people picture that a, a, what casting vision is, is motivating people to movement, okay? Simple phrase, a leader, when you cast vision, when you motivate people to movement, I immediately think JFK, I've got a dream speech, right? We all know about it. You see the pictures of these thousands and thousands of people on the lawn um, there in DC, and he's casting this vision. I have a dream, right? A leader motivates people to movement when they cast vision. But my point to this, this friend of mine that day, and my point since and I try to apply it to what I do. There are so many other ways that leaders provide vision. Here's an example. I say another way the leader provides vision is providing clarity during confusion. Hmm. That you're like, okay, what does it look like? That you, okay, I'm not the leader who speaks from stage and motivates people to move, but okay, 
But you know, at times, and Patrick Lencioni writes about this, even in his book, The Motive, the importance of increasing clarity, decreasing confusion. Yeah. It's one of the top three things he talks about that a leader should do in an organization. So it's like, okay, a leader casts vision. Maybe sometimes you go before your staff or your department and all you're doing is providing clarity during confusion. Like, okay, hey, look, you know what? I know we have some confusion about who reports to who, or especially dotted lines when you have a geofunctional matrix where you have this person's a straight line direct report, and this person's a dotted line. And how does this work? Sometimes leaders need to step and you cast vision by going, let me, let me bring some clarity to this confusion. That's casting vision. People can see more clearly when there's clarity than when there's confusion. Does that make sense? That it's not just motivating people to movement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Another one I talk, another one I talk about, and I love this one. A, a leader casts vision when they inspire hope when it's hard. Mm. You know, Winston Churchill's 1941. He's kind of known for this victory picture he took, um, among many things. But he he did this thing with his fingers, right? He's casting a V for victory, but he does it backwards, starting in 1941. And these pictures that he became very famous for. He's 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 doing it backwards now. He was actually doing it as a double meaning. In one sense, he's saying victory. In another sense, he's saying like, hey, it was in a sense kind of like flipping the bird, at <laughs> the enemies in a sense. And for the people there around him, it was like he was inspiring hope. He recognized it. it's hard. He's inspiring hope when it's hard. Sometimes as leaders, we just have to recognize with our teams, look, I'm disappointed too. Hey. I, I'm sorry. Um where are we going now? Like we just lost this big agreement or this big contract, let's say, mm -hmm. but we're going to be okay. That's yeah. a leader casting vision. So maybe you're a leader listening and you, you got a big heart and you care about people. Well, well, you know what? Sometimes what you need to do is just inspire hope when it's hard. Yeah. You don't feel like you need to be JFK and motivate people to movement. You might not even need to provide clarity to confusion. Maybe in that moment, you just need to provide hope when it's hard. A couple quick other things. And yeah. I'll quit talking about it, but um, I love this one that a leader casts vision when they communicate a conviction about what needs to change. Mm. You know, being a foster parent, I just saw, you know, what if we got more godly people involved in this? And that's the only question I asked for the first couple of years I was here. Like, I would tell people, what? Tell me why you're leading this organization, Kevin. Well, I tell you what, I'm a foster parent. Let me tell you what I learned through the being that. And I'm just communicating a conviction about something that needs to change. I think about Rosa Parks, yeah. you know, she recognized something she needed to change. She didn't stand up on stage and give a big speech. She didn't rile people up. She sat on a bus in the quote unquote wrong place. Yeah. And it was her way of saying, this needs to change. Mm -hmm. She communicated a conviction about what needs to change as leaders. Sometimes we just need to share the burden that's on our heart and that's, that's casting that vision. And sometimes even with the, there are those seasons where as a leader, you've lost that conviction, right? Yeah. <laughs> where for you, that's even dwindling in a thing uh, to the gospels where we see Jesus kind of getting off by himself. I think sometimes that that's that conviction welling back up, right? Where we've got to have that time. One of the things I noticed on, on y'all's website is after working with you guys for so many years, you give people 30 days to kind yeah. of go have a sabbatical, right? And, and yeah. that's such an important part of that rhythm of resetting with the Lord and getting that conviction back. So yeah, I love That's that. exactly why we do it. You know, for us, it's if you've been on staff here for five years, I'm not just talking just pastors, just the lead, just the leader, me. Yeah. You know, if you're in full-time staff here for five years, at the five-year point, you get 30 days off. Yeah. And we, re, you know, we have a guy right now, what we call our extended time off policy. And it's yeah. like, now, how is he resting? This guy loves Disney World. He wants to bring <laughs> his family to Disney World. It's like, that's awesome. That's Go great. have fun with that. And let your, let your spirit breathe yeah. and, and just relax. Yeah. Don't think about us. Well, just, it, and in some senses in leadership, you, you can be beat up. That, that happens so often. And if you're just staying in the grind the whole time and you don't have a place to have that reset for conviction, that's where I've seen in leaders the conviction really drain down it is not having that reset, not having that solid relationship with the Lord. That's great. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Well, I, I say it a few other ways when it comes to, uh, you know, um, 
casting vision. I talk about uh, you cast vision when you establish direction for the drifting. Mm -hmm. I think JFK did that well in his moonshot speech from Rice University in 1963 saying, you know, we're going to send somebody to the moon and bring them back safely in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. He's like, our NASA program, it's drifting right now. And so guess what? I'm going to set some direction here. Now, look, we know it in a fiery speech as well that was kind of fun to watch. Yeah. But I think that's an important part of casting vision. And lastly, I'll say this about vision because I, I love it. That's my, my, probably my favorite point about casting vision is a friend of mine's a, an operator of a Chick-fil-A location. And I'm like, okay, look, I, I, I'm like your biggest fan. Tell me how y'all train your staff and all this type of stuff. And I was surprised, <laughs> at least from this one operator's vantage point, like, yeah, not a lot comes from kind of corporate on that. Like the operator's kind of do their own way. So he talked about, for me, I have six different interviews with anybody wanting to work here part-time because mm -hmm. I want to see, do, do they get to the interview on time? Are they dressed appropriately? All the different things. <laughs> and then he laughingly said, because what we do is we serve chicken, right? I mean, how hard can it be? And I, and I kind of laughed. And he said this in front of our staff. And he said, but that's not all that we do. And I said, what do you mean? And they talked about, there's these YouTube videos you can watch there. It's called like every life has a story. I think is the name of them. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it, these, these little bubble things that pop above their head of what they're thinking. And so these people walk into this video in this Chick-fil-A video and they're, you know, a bubble, a bubble above their head said, I, I immigrated to America when I was 12. You know, I just received my citizenship recently or another one, a bubble above their head might say my, my mom died during childbirth and my dad blames her for me blames me for this or these serious things and his point was which i go a leader casts vision when you give meaning to the mundane and his point was we give meaning to the mundane we don't just serve chicken that's not what we do and in these every life has a story videos you can find on youtube from chick-fil-a they're kind of bringing this meaning to what they do that mm. i mean they serve chicken i mean let's be <laughs> real right but it but is good chicken. It is good chicken. Oh, good. <laughs> and then, you know, and they give meaning to the mundane. Here at no. Chick-fil-A, we serve people. And those people have a story. And they share those stories and commercials we all love about this great employee. Look at what they did. And they went above and beyond. But they bring meaning to the mundane. That's what leaders do also and how we cast vision. Sometimes we need to remind our teams by bringing meaning to the mundane, the everyday stuff of why it's valuable, why it's important, and the impact it can have. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Kevin, you have been a delight to have on and share some vision. And I've just from afar loved getting to know a little bit more about the Mentoring Alliance and what you guys do and the impact you're having. And uh, part of my background, being a former kids and student pastor and executive pastor, uh, love that you guys are finding ways to activate people in the giftings that they have in their local communities that they're at. And it's just such a blessing to those communities and as you guys are moving into a new uh, community coming up here in the next year uh, we are certainly going to be praying for you but would love to connect people more with you guys and mm -hmm. who you are where you are so if you wouldn't mind just sharing with our listeners how they can find you how they can find the mentoring alliance uh, best ways to find you follow you and support you guys yeah, Mentoring Alliance, you can find us at, you know, TheMentoringAlliance.com, all three words. Uh, you'll find us there. Uh, you know, you'll find my podcast called Following to Lead out there somewhere, you know, wherever podcasts are listened to. Uh, and you can find me out there just by Googling my name. You'll see it as well. But would love to connect with people and, uh, and hear more about how God's using you right there where you are as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Kevin, thank you for being here. For all of our listeners, you can find show notes. You can go and like the podcast, follow it, share it with some friends. Uh, and we will see you back here next time on the Vanderbloom and Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everyone.